We're starting a series called The Story of Us. We're going to walk through the book of Acts, which is the one book of history in the New Testament that tells kind of what God did after Jesus was resurrected and taken up. And I think this is an unbelievably timely series for us to walk through. I really do. I want to suggest that one of the most troubling conditions in the church today is what I see to be an ever-increasing insecurity problem. An insecurity problem. This, this not really knowing who we are and being very insecure. You ever hung around an insecure person and kind of watched how that for, causes them to respond or how they kind of try to react and how they, they try to compensate for different things? You, you've seen it. I think sometimes we as a church act like that. I, it's not something new. I saw it start years ago. I remember I, I was around for the very beginning of some of the what we now call contemporary Christian music. And back when there wasn't any of that, and there were just some artists who started creating music that was, that was designed to glorify God and worship God, but had a more contemporary feel because that's w- what they played. That's who they were. You know? And it was, it, it was fresh. It was real. It was something that was authentic. But something happened along the way where it became kind of in fashion to try to have a Christian copy of whatever secular group that was out. You know, and I understand the motive. I understand that there were people coming to the Lord and they liked a certain kind of music and now you know, some of that music maybe didn't glorify God so they wanted to listen to something that did and so you could say, well, if you like that, you'll like this. But it got to the place where in the Christian, used to be Christian bookstores had lots of music. That's where you bought the music, right? You'd go into the Christian bookstore in the music section and they would have, if you like this secular band, then here's the Christian kind of, deal. And, oh, this one's just like that one. And I'm like, come on. And then you go listen to him. You know, if you like Eric Clapton, you'll like this guy. He did not sound like Eric Clapton. I'm just telling you, okay? I'm just trying to be honest right now. And, and I'm just saying, man, it's called art for a reason. Be yourself. Just create art. You know, don't, we don't have to copy. And, and it's kind of grew from there. This thing of always wanting to copy whatever the world's doing because we got we, we to keep up. we got to be kind of in sync. You know, the Christian t-shirts started to do that a little bit where you'd see logos that were clearly from some product and then there was a Christian message, which, <laughs> legality aside, I don't even know what the legality of that is. I mean, some of these, take a look, take a look at this. Like, okay, meant to die. Jesus meant to die for you. It's Mountain Dew. It's awesome. Straight out of God's word, not Compton. Straight out of... God's word. I like that. That's, that's nice. How about this? Jesus Christ, eternally refreshing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lots of sugar, too. This is the one. Sacrifice for me. One, I don't think Starbucks likes that. I don't think Jesus likes that. I, I, have, I don't think he's like, really? Are you kidding me? And then I think we go, yeah, there it is. That's, that's you know, amazing grace is American Idol. There you go. You knew that right away. I mean, so th- this kind of thing sort of where we wanted to copy any pop thing, and it, it kind of morphed into our churches, actually, we went from seeker-sensitive to seeker-pleasing. If, you don't, if you're not aware, the seeker-sensitive movement, I think, had some really helpful parts of it. The idea behind it was we want to be sure that we remember there are people who are not believers yet, who may be in our churches. There are people who we, we want to be, our church to be a place where people can come and hear the gospel in plain English, where the things that we do, the music that we play, all the things that we do can speak to a person who's not yet a follower of Jesus. That's a really good thing. But when you go beyond seeker-sensitive, being aware and, and being prepared for that, to seeker-pleasing, like, it's like people-pleasing. Where everything is, you know, oh, no, no, we're not any different. Don't worry, we don't want to offend with the truth. And we begin to have to adapt everything because, Lord knows, we wouldn't want to be different. And it gets really messed up. And, of course, you know, we pastors are not uh, exempt from it. We had to get on it. We'll take sermon series, and I've been guilty of this, okay? I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers here, but we've been guilty. We'll take sermon series based on some pop movie or, you know, something. Star Wars becomes Spirit Wars, and, you know, you got the little logo and all this stuff. The movie Fifty Shades of Grey, okay? Do you know how many sermon series have been done based on Fifty Shades of Grey? Really, take a look. Fifty Shades of Grey, what God has to say about sex, war, cults, and more. By the way, um, <clears throat> the movie spells it G-R-E-Y, so I think they protect themselves from plagiarism. It's nothing like it. G-R-A-Y. 
so they're okay, okay? I think we're fine. And then this one, five shades of gray. See, again, we're covered. We're not plagiarizing at all. Five shades of gray, and then 50 shades of grace. That's kind of a see what I did there moment, you know? And then, uh, of course, the last one, 50 shades of they. And, you know, we've, we've all done it. We, we've all done that kind of stuff, and, and, you know, it can be harmless at times, but it's this thing of always wanting to kind of be seen as, as, as keeping up, and, and it's a really kind of harmful trend that you see in the church, and it's grown to a place and I see the connection between what I consider a current state of self-loathing in the church. I mean, has there ever been a time where there's less regard for the church by actual church people? I'm not talking about everybody. I'm just saying people who call themselves Christians who, oh, I don't need the church. Oh, I'm not interested in the church. Or people who, who are Christians who spend so much time bashing other Christians who maybe have a different political view. Or the evangelicals, we got to bash them. Or we got to bash the mainliners. And we got to bash those on the right, bash those on the left. And it's like, Jesus said we're supposed to love each other. Okay, where's the bashing coming from? And why is it so in vogue? And why are we jumping on board? It really is. There's this weird disregard that even Christians are having for the church. See, I think in all of our desperation to kind of be like the world and make the world like us, we have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten what makes us the body of Christ. That's why it's so critical that we remember the story of us, and that's what this series is going to walk us through. We're going to begin in the book of Acts. I hope if you have your Bibles, you'll bring them and, and use them. I'm going to show you the scriptures on the screen, and the app has notes, and the, the, the bulletin has notes. I encourage you to take notes, follow them, but I, I'd encourage you to have your own copy of the scriptures, whether it's a paper copy, electronic, whatever. Wherever you read the scriptures on a regular basis, have that. Look these up. I want you to be able to engage with these. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Make sure that you can go back and kind of study them further, if you'd like. But we're starting in the book of Acts. Acts is written by Luke. Okay? He wrote his gospel, and look what he says at the beginning of the book of Acts. He wrote his gospel, and he says to Theophilus, he says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So the first book he's talking about is his gospel of Luke. Some people think of it, the book of Acts just as a continuation, kind of part B, that he paused and then he continued to write what God was doing through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. And he wrote the books to this believer, Theophilus, who he entrusted the writing to. And what's interesting is the way he ends Luke, he gives a brief description of the ascension. Acts, he picks up, and he kind of expands on it. So in Acts chapter 1, we have a, a bigger picture of that conversation, what that ascension was like. Luke briefly tells us it happened, and then in Acts, Luke tells us a little bit more of the detail, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. Let's begin in Acts 1, 1. Okay. All right. All right. I already read that. All right. He'd chosen. Good. Now we're going to continue on. I know where I am. Just testing you. <laughs> he goes on and says, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. He's talking about to his followers appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. This is after the resurrection. So he's appearing to these different ones, teaching, encouraging. And while staying with them, he ordered them. Very important, I want you to make note of this. Underline it in your mind, underline it in your scriptures. And he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he gives them this kind of instruction. Not many days from now, you're going to be baptized. And their question is interesting because they go right to kind of the things that excite us. Well, Lord, is this the end times? Or what's it going to be like? Is this when you're going to bring all things to conclusions? Or what, what is that going to be like? And he says, to them, that's not for you to know. He says, the Father knows that. Don't worry about that. He said, but here's one thing I want you to know. And he said, goes on, picks up here. He says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. So Jesus is taken up, and all that they have is this instruction to go and wait. Wait for what? Wait for the Spirit. 
They'd left everything to follow him. They'd put all their hope in him. They watched him be crucified. They watched him then be, be buried and then resurrected. And now they're like, okay, this thing really is going to happen. And he says, guys, I'm leaving. He said, but I want you to wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit. So we're told approximately 120 men and women go and they wait. And what they do while they're waiting? They prayed. They actually take care of some business. So they select a replacement for Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus and who had taken his own life. They select a replacement, and then Acts chapter 2, we see what actually happens. And can you imagine, by the way, can you imagine if Jesus just told us, okay, guys, I'm going to pour my spirit out, but I want you just to wait until it comes. Well, how long? He didn't tell us. Just wait. And we love waiting, don't you? I mean, really, don't, guys, yeah, you better, you better just kind of put your lives on hold for a little while. Just wait. But this is important. Don't miss it. Well, it ultimately did come, this Acts chapter 2, picking up at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. You know how when it rains here and we get one of those hard rains, and this, this room, you know, we got this metal roof on top, and it starts to make noise, just this deafening noise. Can you imagine? Because that's what it was like this noise that starts to go through like a blowing wind. I don't know if they had manifestation feeling of the wind, but there was this incredible sound like a rushing wind that filled the place where they were sitting. Divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus said. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what Jesus said would happen did happen. Now what's interesting is there's people from all over the world in Jerusalem at the time, all over the region, different places, celebrating the Passover. These are Jews who came back to celebrate Passover. And they, all these people from all different countries and they speak all different languages and they hear the gospel, the truth being proclaimed in their language. Now what's interesting was the miraculous thing the Spirit was doing that the apostles were speaking languages they didn't understand or was it that people were hearing the gospel in their language. The Bible doesn't particularly tell us. Just assume that they were speaking in these other languages. But people are hearing the gospel, and it's all different ones. It's like one guy's from one region, and he goes, wait a minute, I, I understand that. Another guy's from a totally different place. He goes, no, no, they're not speaking that. I, I understand as well. And as you would expect, anytime you get a crowd of people, there's different responses. It says they were all amazed and some wanted to know more, what's, what's this about? Others just started mocking. You know, and, you, you know, and they're like, those folks need a little delayed with the saws. They need to sleep that one off. And it says they thought they were drunk, and Peter responds. Look what he says. This is uh, verse 14 of Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and he addressed them. He says, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Remember, these are religious people who are there for a religious celebration, Passover. They would have known what the prophet said. They would have been aware of this prophecy. And Peter stands up and says, you know what this is. And he quotes Joel, from Joel chapter 2. And in the last days it shall be God, that God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Note that phrase, all flesh. Because this is a, a bit of a game changer. And we'll see in the book of Acts how this actually unfolds for them. Because that means Jews, Gentiles, God is not no particular ethnicity, no particular race. He's going to pour out his spirit on all people. And he goes on and says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, not just your sons in a very patriarchal society. No, no, your daughters are going to be filled with the Spirit. They're going to proclaim and prophesy, speak the Word of God. And your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. This isn't just the young. This isn't just the old. This is everybody. This isn't just Jews. This is Gentiles. This is men. This is women. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my Spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. He goes and he tells them then, after that incredible remembrance, he tells them about Jesus, who was crucified and resurrected, and he reminds them that this was prophesied. And then he finishes with this, verse 36 to 39. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both the Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So there's an indictment there, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Listen, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, it's for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Let me pray for us. Lord, I pray that your word would speak to us and that we would hear what you want to say. Teach us about this gift of the Holy Spirit that truly makes us who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. The gift of the Holy Spirit Repent, be baptized, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Almost two chapters at the beginning of this book dedicated to God filling his people with the Holy Spirit. That's the whole beginning of this story. And there's urgency. Remember, these are Jesus' last words. He could have told them anything. He could have said, guys, remember the scriptures we talked about. Remember what I said on the Sermon on the Mount. Remember that, guys? Remember what I said, you know, in this time or that time, the final things I said in the upper room, any of those things. Here's what's going to happen, guys. He didn't do any of that. He said, what I want you to do, guys, most important thing, he ordered them, do not leave until you receive the promise, the spirit that I promised you. There's urgency. Now, I shared this with you before, and we kind of summarized this idea. Don't leave the port without the presence. He'd he'd already told them the Great Commission, you're going to go and you're going (coughs) to... Be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. He said, make disciples all over. But don't get so caught up in the mission that you forget the power. Don't leave the port without the presence. Remember what Jesus said in John 16, 7? And I I don't think when, when he said it, I don't think the disciples fully understood it. I don't think until the day of Pentecost they understood what this was about. Remember what he said? He said, it's to your advantage that I go so I can send the Spirit. The Messiah. The promised one said, I'm going to leave, which must have freaked them out. But he says, I'm, it, it's to your advantage that I go. Don't worry. You're better off. I'm going to send the Spirit. And he said, the things that you've seen me do, you, you together, you guys are going to do greater. Because my Spirit is going to be in all of you. Peter makes it very clear in verse 39, and this is what I want to just make sure we all grasp. This promise is for all of us who are in Christ. He says it's for your children, for all who are far off, those folks who aren't even here, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. It's for you, your kids, those who are going to come to the Lord through you, all who are going to believe in his name. It's for all of us. And see, what I want us to just stop at the beginning of this story and point out is that the nature of our faith is not just intellectual. It's not simply moral, not just a set of rules, a different kind of rules that we're going to live by. It's not primarily missional, the mission to change the world. All those things are a part of it. It is intellectual. There is a moral component, obviously. There is a mission, but that's not what's first. And the story of us doesn't begin with that. Fundamentally, our faith is relational. Because it all begins with God's spirit residing in us and fellowshipping with us. In fact, if you're taking notes, write this down. I want to say it to you this way. The story of us begins as the story of God's spirit within us. The story of us begins as the story of God's spirit within us. That's who we are. We are the people who are filled with the very spirit and presence of God. It's not just that we have a book and some teachings and we have some some rules that we follow. It's not a textbook. It's not a contract. It's not a manual. It's not any of those things. We are talking about God's spirit resident in his people. It is his spirit who gave the word of God. It is his spirit who helps us understand the word of God. It is his spirit that makes us who we are. We're not just a different club with a different set of rules. We're not a political group that kind of lobbies and tries to get things done because we believe in certain morals. None of those things are who we are. 
And I think the problem is we often let ourselves be reduced to that. No, no, fundamentally, first and foremost, we are the people in whom the very Spirit of God dwells. And that's a game changer. That's powerful. Now, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit? And by the way, that's the right question. Who is the Holy Spirit? Not what is the Holy Spirit? Do you know how many people consider, refer to the Holy Spirit as, like, it? Well, the Holy Spirit, you know, when it comes, one, that's just insulting. The Holy Spirit is God, resident and present within us. He is God. That's what the doctrine of the Trinity is all about, right? God, one God, who manifests himself, who reveals himself in three different ways, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what's interesting, you want to picture, the word Trinity is not even in the New Testament, it's not in the Bible, but it's the, the label of this doctrine. What's interesting, you want to look at, at when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist and he came up out of the water, you remember, you see all three members of the Trinity in that scene. The Father speaks, this is my Son whom I'm well pleased. The Spirit descends on Jesus, the Son, who's coming up out of the water. They're all three there. The Spirit is a person of the Godhead, if you will. And you know, the Trinity can kind of cook your brain a little bit if you try to think about it too much, but I mean, don't. I mean, we try to come up with illustrations, and you know, one, one of the common ones is the egg. It's like there's one egg, but there's a shell, there's a yolk, and there's a white, and that's fine, that's great, but, but it, all, all analogies are going to break down because we're not talking about a physical thing. We're talking about the Holy Spirit of God. We are talking about God who Jesus said, Father is spirit, and he is able to, in his omnipotence, manifest himself in these three persons, if you will, of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit is one of those. So it is the Holy Spirit, when we talk about having the Spirit, we're talking about God's presence dwelling within us. He's not an impersonal force, but rather he is God living in the life of the believer. And because of that, it makes everything different, and it frames who we are. Let me give you a few ways that that happens. One, the Holy Spirit transforms us. The Holy Spirit transforms us. This isn't just something, a teaching where we learn and we get better. It's not like a discipline. The Holy Spirit fundamentally changes us. He transforms us. And this is something that the, the followers of Jesus Christ should have been, those who were Jewish, should have been aware of because it had been prophesied for hundreds of years. This is Ezekiel chapter 36. You remember God's people were under judgment because they went up and down in their adherence to the faith. A good leader, a good king would lead in a good way and the people would follow and then godless king would come and they'd build idols and just this history of ups and downs and finally God brought judgment but in the midst of the judgment he promises his people it's not always going to be this way I'm going to do something and he prophesies in Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 25 through 27 what he's going to do and he tells about the spirit look what he says he says I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart. The problem is not just what we do. The problem is our heart. Sin is like a cancer that destroys, destroys our heart and our spirit. So look at God's solution. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. His spirit is the one who's going to do the work of transformation. He completely changes us. The theological word for this is regeneration. It's the, something that the spirit does uniquely in us that brings our spirit to life and changes us. Jesus used the phrase born again. And we throw that phrase around, you know, we, we forget that when that phrase was first heard, it was really odd. You know, we know it. We've been around, if you've been around church at all, you probably have a, you know, shirt that, with Coca-Cola logo that says born again or something on it, you know? So we've heard it and we kind of have the deal. But Nicodemus, to whom it was first said, he'd never heard that phrase before. He comes seeking Jesus at night. He was a religious leader and he didn't want to be too conspicuous because Jesus was pretty controversial. And he comes and he inquires of him. And Jesus says to him, um, you, know, you want to have life? Here's, here's how you do it. You must be born again. 
And Nicodemus was a really smart guy, and he asked kind of the obvious question. Like, seriously, Jesus? Literally? Like, am I supposed to go back into my mother's stomach and be born again? No, that's what, exactly what John chapter 3, that's exactly what he does. He's, he's like, what are you talking about? And Jesus explains it. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay, he's talking a different kind of birth, a spirit birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And then he gives this incredible illustration. He says, the wind blows wherever it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. And you have to realize that is just a very cool illustration that Jesus gave. Because the the word in Greek, it's like a word play. The word pneuma is the word for spirit. It's the word for wind. It's the word for breath. And stop and think about it. We can't see the wind. We can see what it does. We can't see it, kind of like the spirit. But in the same way, we are depend every day. Our lives depend on the wind as we breathe it in. We don't sit and wonder, I can't see any oxygen or any air here, but it's there. The breath. I breathe in the life. I can't see it, but I receive it and I breathe it. And I'm given life. And Jesus is saying, that's what it's like for those who are born of the Spirit. It's like the wind. called it being born again. See, here's the thing. Because of the Spirit's work, when we become a follower of Jesus Christ and surrender our lives to him, we are changed. We are different at a spiritual level. It's like we talk about a molecular level, things are changed, and fundamentally whatever it is is changed. Well, at a spiritual molecular level, we are changed when Jesus Christ becomes our Savior and he fills us with our spirit. Let me tell you one of the problems that we face in the church today. There's all kinds of folks who've attended church for years. They've sat, they've sang the songs, they've listened to the sermons. Um, They've never been born again. And it's very disheartening if you hear sermons about what can be, about what God has said and what what should be, and you're like, but that's not my experience. I I haven't had an experience of being brought to life. I haven't been changed like that. I feel just the same. I try to follow some different rules. That's not our salvation. Our salvation is God's spirit bringing our spirit to life. Because of sin, our spirit is dead. In Jesus Christ, he forgives us, God's spirit fills us, and we are brought to life. That's the gospel. See, the story of us begins as the story of God's spirit within us. It makes us who we are. Second thing the Spirit does, the Holy Spirit leads us. Not only does he transform us, he leads us. You know, we talk about following Jesus. You know, I'm a follower of Jesus. Come follow Jesus. Well, those first followers, we understand, they physically followed him. It's like he goes to the side of the, the lake and says, you fishermen, come follow me. And they're like, like now? Yes, now. I mean, like literally, what about my stuff? Leave your stuff. And they do. They leave the boats, they leave the nets, and they go and they follow Jesus. Matthew, you're a tax collector. Come follow me. Well, like now? Yes, right now. Well, what about all the money? Leave it. Can I have a little? No, leave it. I'm just putting myself in Matthew's place. I mean yourself. I'm putting you, not me. I'm a pastor, y'all. Stop. (laughs) But he gets up and he leaves. And we we recognize that they were following Jesus. They're literally, he's saying, we're going to go here, follow me. And so they're looking at the back of his head. and They're following Jesus. He's going that way, so are we. They had three years of that. And then he's taken up. And all they know is, i got to wait for the Spirit. And when they're filled with the Spirit, their experience of following Jesus becomes exactly like ours. Now I'm going to follow Jesus by his Holy Spirit, by listening for his voice and obeying what he says, doing what he says. Listen for his voice, do what he says. John 16, 13, and 14. When the Spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all the truth, for he'll not speak on his own authority. That's what Jesus was saying. He will guide you into all the truth, for he'll not speak of his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he'll declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he'll take what is mine, and he will declare it to you. The very spirit of Jesus, bringing his word to us, giving his leadership. 
He will guide you into all truth, not just partial truth. Here's the problem. When we try to just kind of take the Bible and draw truths from it without the Holy Spirit leading, that's when we get in trouble with partial truth. You know, we take a truth and we start kind of trying to, trying to live that truth or we try to, try to preach that truth or even beat people over the head with that truth. Instead, when, when, when the Holy Spirit leads us, he, he leads us in all truth. It can be the exact same scripture. We can be talking, looking at scriptures about sexual ethics and we can be talking to someone about what the Bible says about sexuality. And the difference is when the Spirit leads me, not only does he accurately help me convey God's truth about sexual ethics and biblical sexuality, but in the way I do it, because that's one part of the truth. How I communicate it will either be in step with or out of line with his truth as well. If I'm using it to beat someone over the head and be unkind, I am, that's, I'm walking outside the truth. But if instead I'm sharing it in love and I'm sharing it to build someone up and I'm sharing it to, to kind of encourage someone in what God has for them, now I'm walking in all the truth because I'm following the Spirit. You understand? We sometimes walk off with partial truth. He says, no, no, he's going to guide you into all the truth. See, that means the goal is our daily communion and interaction with the Spirit. That's what this Christian life is all about, really. Daily communion and interaction with him, learning to listen and to follow the Spirit of God. And you're like, wow, that, I, mean, I don't know how to do that. I know, that's the point. We've got a friend and a, a brother here in the fellowship is walking through some really tough stuff right now. We are meeting this last week. And he's just needing to hear from God on some things. So I said, okay, that's all, that's all we're going to work on. I, just, I recommended some reading for him as far as just some, some Bible reading and a devotional book. And I said, I, what I want you to do is just have a, a quiet time each day. No, no big deal. We're not talking about a marathon. We're talking about sit down, a cup of coffee, read the scripture, pray over some of the things in your day. And then, when you get up and go live your day, now I want you to start talking to Jesus all day. When you're going into a meeting, I want you to talk to Jesus about what the agenda for the meeting is. When you come into some kind of point of conflict, I want you to, before you jump in, I want you to listen and talk to Jesus. Before you kind of have a relational encounter and you start going down the road, I want you to, Jesus, and, and next time we come together, we're going to talk about what God said to you and what you did about it and how to go. Because you understand listening and hearing him is more important than the actual actions themselves. They're, not that they're not important, they are. But what's more important is that we grow in our relationship with him and we become more like him. Because see, that's the thing. You know, as you walk through the course of your day, learning to listen and hear him is powerful. That's how the guidance works. You remember when Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, 11, 12, he said, when you're brought before rulers, don't worry about what to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Is he, can he really do that? That's Luke 12, 11, 12. I mean, can he really do that? Do these guys who are actually going to go before Roman governors and tribunals, would he really do that? Yes, he would. I want to suggest you he offers the same type of leadership and guidance for us. Learning to listen and follow. That's why the story of us begins as the story of God's spirit within us. It's, it makes us who we are. A third thing we find in these passages, the Holy Spirit empowers us. He empowers us. Acts 1.8 said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Look how Paul said it in his regard. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. And what's interesting is he'd been among the Corinthians so they could verify what he's saying. They're not just reading about what he did with someone else. He's talking about how he responded to them. And he said, my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Paul, one of the most brilliant theologians ever, brilliant mind, but we're told just from some different kind of passages that he wasn't necessarily the most powerful, impressive orator. He wasn't an impressive presence. So they're like, no, you're right. It wasn't all about Paul and his wonderful oratory, but it was the demonstration of the Spirit and the power, so that your faith might not rest in wisdom of men. Wow, Paul's awesome. We should get his book. Your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, the world around us desperately needs to see the power of God. They don't need to see us doing a bad imitation of them or a kind of cleaned up, sanitized imitation of what the world does. 
We shouldn't be racing to jump through the hoops that the world sets out from. No, no, we need to be listening for the voice of the Spirit and walking in his wisdom and his power. What does the power of the Spirit look like? It looks like the a power to overcome sin. It's exactly what it looks like. I'm afraid we, we spend too much time trying to do sin management instead of following the Spirit and letting him empower us to have victory over sin. You may have a sin that's been kicking your tail. Might be something you're looking at, and you know I shouldn't be looking at this. Might be an anger issue. Might be a, 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 a buying impulse. It might, it might be the way you speak. I don't know, but you know what it is, and it's that thing that when you do it, you know you've done it, and you're like, God, why? Why do I keep doing that? I don't want to do that anymore. It keeps beating me up. Why do I get stuck with that same thing? I want to suggest it's because we're sitting here trying to exercise sin management. Discipline isn't enough. Count, accountability isn't enough. Discipline and accountability are good, but they're not enough. We need the power of the Spirit to actually be able to walk differently. And you know how you do that? It's not s sitting by simply trying to avoid sin. Now, don't go and say, Sean said, we don't have to avoid sin anymore. It's really good. I love my church. Yeah, no, I don't want to hear that. I will come after you. No, but what I'm saying is it's not enough. The fact is, it's a totally better approach to begin to follow him and try to, try to pursue him. Rather than just trying to avoid sin, how about focusing on pursuing him? You know, here's the deal. You're, you're about to go and you're in this confrontation. You're about to say that hurtful thing that you know is just not going to be helpful. And you know, and I, we've all been there. And the Spirit says, you know what, don't. Or instead of, before I even have that conversation, Lord, what do you want to say? You want to know what, those times when I've said that thing that I just know it's hurtful and it's, you know, it, it, it was never because I went and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Oh, give it to them, Sean. They need it. Mm. You go on. You uncork that van. You open that can on them. That'll be good. That has never been... I, the, in fact, what's interesting, and you know this, just stopping and saying, Lord, what do you think? Before we even finish the word think, we know. A lot of times we're just trying to avoid what we know, he's saying, because it feels good to do that flesh thing. And so we're plugging our ears and la, 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 la. God, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. The minute we unplug our ears and say, Spirit, what do you want me to do? Spirit, help me to follow you. Spirit, do you realize it's very hard to sin when you're in the mindset of following the Spirit, when you're consciously focusing on him? It's so much easier to live victorious when you keep your eyes and your mind on the Spirit. So the Spirit, power of the Spirit looks like the power to overcome sin. It looks like the gifts of the Spirit. Think about wisdom, that you know you don't have enough wisdom, but he gives you wisdom to walk through a situation, and you know you're walking in God's wisdom. How about discernment, a gift of the Spirit, where you're able to see beyond the surface. Surface looks okay, but there's something there the Spirit's pointing out. That's discernment. We talk about all kinds of gifts. Healing, we, we pray for healing. We've seen God heal people. Empowered ministry, being able to minister in ways that you go, I'm not this good. I'm not able to do this. I wasn't that good with kids. I'm not able to, to do that ministry that well, but I feel the power of the Spirit. That's the power of ministering in Him. How about the fruit of the Spirit? How about the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. How about the fruit of the Spirit? That's power. Do you realize how powerful it is when the world around us sees us love in ways that just don't make sense? How about when you've experienced it? You ever experienced the power of the love of God working through you? Think about that person at work, that person in your family, or something, they keep hurting themselves, they keep hurting other people, and it's like it gets under your skin and you're aggravated. Imagine the power to love them in a way that you go, that doesn't make sense. That's the power of God's love. That's the power of the Spirit. How about a joy that isn't at all subject to the circumstance? I'm not happy about circumstances, but my joy is untouched. Or I may be happy about circumstances, but my joy isn't affected. My joy is from another source. Peace. You ever known someone who everything around them is blowing up and they're just like calm at the center of the storm? They have a supernatural peace. That's the power of the Spirit. That's what the power of the Spirit looks like. And, and I'm telling you, that'll change the world. When we begin to walk in the power of the Spirit. The story of us begins as a story of God's Spirit within us. Last thing, 
the Holy Spirit multiplies us. Remember he said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses. It's interesting, it wasn't just power to be his witnesses, although I think we do receive that power, but it's power in general. But he does say, you'll be my witnesses. All a witness does is tell what they've seen, right? That's the job of a witness. I'm not talking about, you know, you going through evangelism training and going and knocking on your neighbor's doors. And hey, there's nothing wrong with that. If God leads you and he opens those doors, we should be, we should be willing to do that. I'm talking about something different, though. I'm talking about as we experience the reality and the power of the Spirit in us, we just begin to share it. Do you realize how powerful your testimony is when you've seen the power of the Spirit? And what's fascinating is when you begin to share what God's been doing and what you've seen as a witness, you'll be amazed at how the Spirit will use that to resonate and connect with what he's been saying to them. And that's the most powerful kind of speaking. I can't tell you, this, today I'll have people come up to me after this service and say, oh my gosh, did someone tell you? Did my brother-in-law tell you? He's an idiot. You don't listen to him. But did, why did you, how did you know that? How did you know about that? And I'm just here to tell you, I didn't. All that is, is God's spirit, what God's saying to me and asking me to share, resonating with God, what God's spirit has said to you. And that's the most powerful kind, isn't it? We have no idea what God's doing in a person's life. But when we share and tell our story, that's how it multiplies. See, the story of us begins as the story of God's spirit within us. Francis Chan wrote in his book, Multiply, do you feel desperate for the power of the Holy Spirit today? That question, when I read it, caught me. It said, if not, you may have a misunderstanding of who you are or who the Holy Spirit is. He goes on to say, without the Spirit, we can't know God. We can't understand Scripture. We can't overcome sin. We can't transform lives. Folks, we need the power of the Spirit. And I want to ask you that question. Are you desperate for the power of the Spirit? Or is it possible we don't know who we are? Or we don't know who the Spirit is. I guess my challenge is I don't want us to settle for anything less than what the Spirit has for us. He wants to fill you. The Spirit wants to speak in and through you. The question is, will we let him? Lord, we want to respond to you. Jesus, fill us with your spirit. Jesus, I want us to sing a song that I can't sing for you. You're the only one who can sing this song for you. Oh, let's take a moment in the spirit. There's nothing worth more that'll ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence lord as a congregation let's pray this together sing holy spirit holy spirit you are welcome here come fly this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Oh 
say fill this place let's not make it about the building although I love when he does the spirit dwells in us we are the temple invite him to fill you let's sing it Jesus we cry Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere lord your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your Lord, we look to you and we trust you. And we just ask that you would fill us and remind us that this is where the story of us begins with your spirit indwelling us and leading us to things that we can only imagine. We trust you and we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.